Bond is a student of his body and of the technology of his sport. There is little he doesn't understand about eating and of aerodynamics and how they have helped him in the trial so far. Having figured out the position his body must stay in, the focus he must have, Greg LeMond prepares to start the race. Quite simply, he must go faster than most think he can. What lies ahead is the scent. The Eiffel Tower, the Place de la Concorde, the Champs-Élysées, and the finish. The last of the cyclists to go is the leader, Laurent Fignon, who believes that the error of the yellow jersey should always set the pace. Such is the case again. Greg LeMond employs the helmet, the disc on the wheel, and the posture created by the unique and controversial handlebars. The clock will tell him if it's all worth it. Laurent Fignon receives the final count at the start. One way or the other, he will wear the yellow jersey down the Champs-Élysées. Greg has elected not to have his split times relayed to him from the pursuit car. This is an all-out ride. No strategy whatsoever. Laurent Fignon, never leading this tour by more than a few seconds, now must defend the 50 holes over Greg LeMond after 2,000 miles. Unlike LeMond, Fignon does choose two disc wheels. And his manager, Cyril Guimard, well, he's complained about the triathlete's bars, the Greg LeMond's ride, the referee's decision, they're okay. The Parisienne racing towards the city he was born and bred in and knows these roads so well. They've never been more important to him than this day. LeMond has covered seven miles. Right now, he has gained 21 seconds on Pignon. He needs at least 29 more. He is passing the offices of L'Equipe, the newspaper whose lineage is traced back to one printed on yellow paper, which started the Tour de France in 1903. Yellow paper, yellow jersey. Team Le Mans, son Scott, wife Kathy, wait for Daddy at the finish. Scott won't remember a thing, and Daddy's trying to get home as fast as he can. So the most epic pursuit in the history of the Tour de France is on. The yellow jersey chasing for his life, chasing an American, Greg LeMond, just two minutes down the road. The Alps have been replaced by the Eiffel Tower as the backdrop for the race. Near the city limits of Paris, with six and a half miles to go, Le Mans is not picking up as much time. 24 seconds is the amount he has gained. He needs 27 more. Aware that Greg Le Mans is making the best time, Cyril Guimard urges on his charge in yellow. It's late afternoon. Still very hot. Greg LeMond heads for the tunnel by the sand at 30 miles an hour. Vignon must go faster. Some way, somehow, he has to get the clock back in his favor and has seven miles to do it. Either way, these two men, separated by less than a minute for two weeks and joined by comeback dreams for three years, are heading straight to what seems to be a photo finish. Greg LeMond is the fastest man at all the intermediate checks over all the 136 cyclists who have gone before him. But at his request, he has no idea how well he's doing. Right now, two miles to go to the finish on the Champs-Élysées. And he has gained 32 seconds on Laurent Fignon. He needs 19 seconds more as he streaks toward the Place de la Concorde. Laurent Fignon, knowing the urgency of the moment, must pick up more speed. He, in spite of the way Greg LeMond has strategically placed this race, has been getting as much information as he can. When Vignon won the Tour back in 83 and 84, he won because of his prowess in time trialing. Ironic now for him to find himself on the defensive.
Pignon was entering the dark tunnel, but further up the Champs-Élysées, Greg Lamont now knew he was winning the stage, his third stage victory of the Tour de France. The question that remained, was he getting the second that would give him the yellow jersey worn by Laurent Pignon? Pignon moves along towards the Place de la Concorde that minutes ago was the arena for Greg Lamont. Both of these riders in the Tour de France have known what it's like to come to the Concorde in the lead. At the finish, Kathy Lamont, Greg's wife, plays the arithmetic game that everyone else is playing. When Greg Lamont rides, he is aware of what is around him. He will be sensing the history of the place. You see the cobblestone road as he turns at the far end of the Champs-Élysées. He's now headed downhill toward the finish. He assumes that aerodynamic position on the bike. He will be going faster now than at any other stage of this time trial. The Tour de France, after 2,030 miles, has come down to the last kilometer. The clock continues to tick in the right way. Otto, the man who greets Greg Lamont every day at the finish line and hands him food and drink. Six tenths of a mile. now nears the same line but the news at the finish line continues to say that this is going to be so very close Lamont and the final yards he will clearly have the fastest time of all the cyclists today the seesaw battle through the tour between these two men First Le Mans led, then Fignon, then Le Mans again, then Fignon, and now, who? The last 200 yards. Ironically, Greg Le Mans gains on Pedro Delgado, who fell from this race in the Alps. Delgado started two minutes before Le Mans did. A reflection of just how fast Greg Le Mans has been today. The bitter victory of 86, the hunting accident, the other injuries, and the lack of confidence seemed so long ago. Pignon approaches the Arc de Triomphe. The key time is 27.47. If he's slower than that, the yellow jersey is lost. And Le Mans time represented an average speed of 34 miles an hour. No Tour de France time trial has ever been quicker. At the finish, Greg Lamont listens to French radio analyze the numbers. He still is not sure if he was fast enough. now just over two football fields from the finish line and still Greg Lamont doesn't know which way the closest Tour de France in history is going to go the magic time is gone 27 47 and that means the yellow jersey for Lauren Fignon has been lost <laughs> Did he 
How does it compare, if it's possible that anything like this could compare with anything that's gone before, with 1986, when you Nothing wanted, like, compares. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. After all the arithmetic about the time trial, did you really think that it was going to be possible? I thought it was possible, but when I warmed up today, I didn't think it was possible because we had such a strong tailwind. And when you have a strong tailwind, it's hard to make a difference, but I didn't know until I crossed the line. Unbelievable. Kathy's reaction. Kathy? What's your feeling? I never did. Did you think he could do it? No. I thought like one percent. So incredible. Lauren Fignon had become part of an intricate plot, a plot which he thought he had mastered, a plot which would end with him riding down the Champs Elysees and winning the Tour de France, his third. But as we've been saying for three weeks. The clock doesn't understand those dreams, and neither does the Tour de France. And so the final standings in the 76th edition of the Tour de France reveal that Greg LeMond won in the smallest margin ever recorded in this race, eight seconds. That was the difference about a football field after 2,031 miles in the Tour de France. Pedro Delgado finishes third, and Andy Hampson, a major disappointment for the United States 7-Eleven effort. Twice a winner and now a loser in his home city of Paris, Laurent Fignon knows both ends of a coloured career. That's Greg LeMond with his 75 years of age, he puts him on the number one position on the podium. Between Greg LeMond and Laurent Fignon, they have made the 1989 Tour de France the greatest ever. And the reward was only one yellow jersey and it goes to the United States and Greg LeMond. Comebacks are always a part of the fascination with sports, from so far down to so high up. How does it happen? Like so many things, it begins with the most simple beliefs, the one you must have in yourself. That must be translated into results by dedication, the knowledge that dedication, which feeds on belief, can make it so. Greg Lamont has held all these feelings, and now everyone must believe that this comeback takes the pessimists and puts them where they belong. Laurent Fignon will be told he was part of the greatest race of all, of cycling's greatest races. It will mean little to a man who was a fixated as Greg on winning once again. Dedication and belief will hopefully bring him back. How is it possible that the defending champion shows up late for the start? How is it possible Greg LeMond, with bad memories of this race and shotgun pellets in his body, can turn in the fastest one-day speed ever on the tour? And how is it that Laurent Fignon could possibly be so strong, then give up so much time? We'll never know, but the Tours de France that will follow this one will struggle to beat this one, the one that held its greatest surprise until the last, the one starring Pedro, Laurent, and Greg.